one and all. On behalf of the extramural lectures team of IIT Madras, I am delighted to welcome all of you to what promises to be an intriguing and thought-provoking session with one of India's foremost diplomats. I am Emil Biju, and it is my honor to be your host for this evening. Our distinguished speaker for today is the former National Security Advisor of India, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon. Mr. Menon has had a long and illustrious career in public service that spanned diplomacy, national security, atomic energy, and foreign policy. He started his career in 1972 with the Indian Foreign Service. He has served as Ambassador of India to Israel and China and as High Commissioner to Sri Lanka and Pakistan. He was appointed as the Foreign Secretary of India in 2006 and took over as the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister from 2010 to 2014. He has also served as the Advisor to the Atomic Energy Commission. He has authored the book titled Choices Inside the Making of Indian Foreign Policy based on his experiences while serving as the National Security Advisor. He currently serves as the Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Institute of Chinese Studies and is a Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the National University of Singapore. Sir, it's our privilege to have you here with us today. We are sure that your rich depth of experience will inspire new thinking and enlighten us in domains beyond our strict realm of pursuit. May I request Professor Joe Thomas from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences to welcome the chief guest on our behalf. Thank you, sir. Sir, I would now like to invite you to address the gathering. Thank you, thank you very much for having me, for asking me. And thank you also for giving me such a huge topic to thinking in the long term about India's foreign affairs strategy. Uh, I wasn't quite sure where to begin and uh, so what I thought I'd do is speak for about half an hour about uh, the basic drivers and therefore the goals of Indian foreign policy. Why do we have a foreign policy? Uh, how the strategy to achieve those goals and then what we should be doing today, you know, faced with today's situation, and then maybe open it up to, to a question and answer after that. I, in one way, we are fortunate, we as India, because if you look at our condition at independence, it was clear what the goal of Indian foreign policy, Indian policy had to be. In 1947, partition had displaced about 10 million people, Life expectancy was around 26 years. Literacy was around 14%. Among women, it was 8%. We couldn't feed ourselves. We'd just gone through the Bengal famine, which was actually a man-made famine. And we, the Indian economy had grown at less than 0.5% from 1900 to 1950, which, if you think of it, is miserable. So one of the most advanced and prosperous societies on earth, which produced and actually had been the biggest produ producer of manufactures for most of history, had been reduced by 200 years of colonialism into one of the most miserable, one of the most backward societies. So obviously our job, first job, priority over everything else, was to transform India into a prosperous, modern, strong, country where every Indian could try and achieve his potential, had a chance at least, his or her potential. Uh, and that took priority over all other goals. I mean, it was obvious. I, I think given our condition, there was really no other choice. Uh, it wasn't recovering lost territory, undoing partition, or organizing our neighborhood. It certainly wasn't getting status in the world, glory, none of these things. It was just taking care of the miserable condition that our own people, we found ourselves in. So our task, at least the foreign policy task, therefore, was to enable the transformation of India into, a, as I said, strong, prosperous, modern nation. Uh, and 
to create an environment in which that transformation was possible. And foreign policy was obviously essential because there was no way we could do this ourselves. We didn't have the capital, we didn't have the technology, we were not in a condition, we didn't have the resources. And if you look at the long-term drivers, the geography, the history, the resource endowment, uh, and it will tell you that right through history, India has been most prosperous and most successful when we've been most connected to the world. Uh, you look at our geography, for instance, and because these are the basic drivers of foreign policy, not just for India, for any country. We have a geography which is basically open on three sides. Uh, you've had constant movement of peoples from east and west, and the ocean. Thanks to the monsoons, you had deep, deep water navigation in the Indian Ocean long before anywhere else in the world. You have, you have a ma uh, pilot's handbook, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, telling a pilot how to navigate, when to catch the winds, to come from all the way from the Red Sea to the Coromandel Coast, actually. Uh, and this is in 57 BC, which means they've already collected the knowledge and gathered it long before Christ is born. Uh, so you are connected to the world. Your geography connects you to the world. Uh, and the British legacy, however, made us sea blind in two ways. One, the maritime security was the Royal Navy's job, and the Royal Navy was handled out of London. So the gov British government of India took care of the land boundaries. But the sea was not their business. That was imperial business. It was handled out of London, and it was managed for. But also, the British taught us a version of our own history which justified their rule in India. It was a version of history which periodized our history by religion. It was arbitrary, where he's saying there was a Hindu period, a Muslim period. It was a history which became an account of foreign invaders creating empires in India, one after the other, the Kushans, the, all to justify their own rule as foreigners who had invaded India. And, and basically, it was the history of a small portion of the Indus Valley and the Indo-Gangetic Plain, I mean, really just the part around the Doab near, near, uh, near the Jamna and the Ganga. Uh, it ignored where our real history always has been, in the core civilizational areas which were the most prosperous, the most dynamic, whether it is the Indus Valley, Gujarat, whether it is the Malabar and the Coromandel Coast, whether it's Vanga, in Orissa, Bengal, the whole. These are the parts that were connected to the world, that were most advanced. And those are the histories we never taught. We, in fact, there are Indians who still don't, even today in school. Those are not the histories we tell ourselves, because those are the parts that were most connected to the world. And those were the parts which, until the great divergence happened in the 18th, mid-18th, late 18th century, until then were as advanced as any other parts of the world, whether in China or in Northern Europe. Uh, the the result of, of this open geography was that, apart from being a trading nation and a major source of manufacturers, India was also a major source of military manpower. Half of Mahmud of Ghazni's troops, when he took Samarkand and Bukhara in Uzbekistan, were actually from the subcontinent. And he managed to cut 500 war elephants across the Hindu Kush into Uzbekistan when he took them. We forget this. We were a major source of military technology, of weapons, and of military manpower throughout this long extended period of, of history. But we've always been people rich and resource poor. And if you look at us, we have no non-ferrous metals. Even today, 80% of our imports are maintenance imports. We import fertilizer, we import crude oil, we import moong dal, but we import things like copper, which are essential. None of these can we do without, by the way. And then, of course, we import the things at the higher end of the value chain, high technology and so on, which is why we've been a trading nation. Both the open geography of the Indian Ocean and the location that that gives us, thanks to the monsoons, and because we've been resource poor and we need the resources from outside. And the most successful uh, well, dynasties, for instance, Cholas, 13 centuries, were the ones who were most connected to the world. 
So it's the basic drivers of foreign policy in India drive you to engagement with the world. There is no avoiding it. Look at our own experience since independence. You tried autarky for a while in the late 50s, 60s, early 70s. How did that work? You grew at what we used to call the Hindu rate of growth, 3.5 percent. The moment you opened up the economy in 1991, those are the, really the best decades of India's growth ever in history. And you managed to pull people out of, out of poverty, out of, out of their misery, on a scale which had never been seen before in India and has only been seen in one other country, which is China. So, in a sense, engagement has to be taken for granted. The question is, what kind of engagement do we do? And that is not always the same. It's not like these drivers will always operate the same way in your foreign policy, because in a sense, your, your interests grow and develop also. Technology changes things. I mean, until, what, 50 years ago, the Himalayas were an unsurpassable barrier. You were safe behind that wall. Today, technology means you can not just look across it, but you can actually fight in it. I mean, the fact that you can fight battles in Siachen at 18,000 feet, this was impossible. When I was born, nobody thought, which is why they didn't bother with drawing the LOC beyond NJ9842, because they thought, Who's ever going to go there? It's just impossible. So technology changes it. Also, your own growth changes it. When we started reform, radical reform in 91, uh, something like 15.2% of India's GDP was external merchandise trade. By 2014, it was 49.6%. That's just external trade in goods, imports, exports. That's almost half your GDP. If you add services to it, that's more than half your GDP. We are not a world unto ourselves, even though we might like to think so. But you need the rest of the world. But look at the difference. In 1991, most of that trade went west, to Europe, to the Americas, through Suez. By 2014, over 33% of it goes through the South China Sea. So suddenly, South China Sea becomes an Indian interest, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. At the same time, for China also, she is slightly lower percentages. We were 49, and both our percentages have dropped, but we're still in the 40s. Uh, but for China also, the South China Sea becomes a core interest in the same period. So suddenly you're rubbing up against each other. Your definition of your interest has grown, changed, so has theirs. Uh, so. I suppose this is all a rather roundabout way of saying we have a foreign policy because both our situation and our basic goal of transforming India require it. And we have no way, uh, there's no way that we can avoid engagement. So what sort of engagement, what sort of strategy should we actually follow in that engagement? Uh, you know, a strategy, has to have three elements. One is, of course, a goal, the ends that you're trying to achieve, which we've just described. You have to have the means. There's no point setting wonderful goals. I'm going to rule the world if you don't have the means to do it. But more important, you also have to take into account the situation in which you find yourself. So it's really a dynamic between all three, between the goals you set yourself, the means, and the situation, and your correct appreciation of the situation and the possibilities it opens up for you to achieve your... So it's an ends and means problem, in a sense. And setting the goals, of course, is a political function in all states. But working, it's the other, polit the other mechanisms of the state which do the rest of it, of seeing where, the, of providing the means and so on. And if you look at the kinds of strategies that other powers have followed through history, uh, it varies. If you are weak, if you lack the means, you follow a reactive strategy. You react to what other people do. And as you acquire the means to shape your environment, you start being proactive. You try and change the situation you're in. We are in a situation where we started with almost no means, actually, if you look at it. Look at relative, but the relative power balance between you, your neighbors, the world itself has changed steadily in your favor. 
There's only one country whose vis-a-vis -vis whom your relative power has actually diminished since independence, and that's China, who has done even better than you in terms of the accumulation of hard power. But you have managed vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, and you can see the difference. In 48, when Pakistan attacks you in Kashmir, you go running for help to the UN, and you have to accept a ceasefire and there, whatever they impose on you, you accept it, you live with it. When in 1970, by 1971, you have sufficient power to help in the creation of Bangladesh, despite the opposition of the world's greatest superpower, despite the opposition of Pakistan, which is no small state at that stage, was much more powerful than she, relatively at that time, than she is today. And despite the fact that every country in the world votes against separatism, because they all have their own separatist problems and are frightened of it, except Bhutan who votes with you. So it's two against the rest of the world in the UN. But it doesn't matter, you still manage to create the only state after Israel was created in, by UN resolution in 1948. And by 2008, you managed to actually get the world to change the nuclear rules in your favor by doing the civil nuclear initiative. What do you do? You get them to make a special exemption for India, which treats you like a nuclear weapon state, allows everybody to cooperate with you. It's special to you. Now, that's an accretion of power. What is power? Power is the ability to get work done, right? To get your work done, get other people to do what you want. And your job here is to get the international system to make it possible for you to transform. And you are displaying increasing levels of power. But you don't have yet the kind of power that, say, the US has. Or So when you look at the relative hierarchy of power, you are still a country with a huge number of poor people. You are also a country with limited experience of the use of power. Because frankly, we haven't been that powerful for so long. And that it does take something to learn how to use it. And you still have huge unfinished tasks at home which you still need to do. All the rising powers in history have chosen a strategy of keeping their heads down while they build their own strength. Those who don't, who proclaim their great power status, try and who try too early, who actually overreach, who set goals for themselves which are beyond their means, have suffered. Look at Wilhelma in Germany, look at militarist Japan in the 30s. I mean, they set themselves goals which they couldn't sustain, and the result was disaster for themselves, their own people. Uh, the Soviet Union, towards the end, once she got into an arms race with the US, and into things like Afghanistan, was bled white. She had a system which couldn't sustain the external engagements that she took. Uh, Pakistan is another example, actually, of a state which tried, by seeking strategic depth, tried to take Kashmir from you. If you look at her relative condition compared to you and all her other neighbors, Iran, all the Central Asian states, is much worse today than it was before. She's much more dependent on China and superpower sponsors than she ever has been in her history. We don't know whether China is an example, whether Belt and Road, whether this huge commitment abroad, whether she has taken on, bitten off more than she can chew. We don't know yet. I mean, that's, I think that's an open question. But no matter how powerful you are, and we are still somewhere in that intermediate zone where we have to get a sense of where we are, you need to set up a hierarchy of tasks and to work with others. You cannot do this alone. Uh, no state can achieve its goals on the international stage today on its own. So we have a goal which I think is is the only goal we have, and it's going to be our goal for a long time to come, until we can abolish poverty, until we can abolish disease, until we can take care of our own children. You know, there's a whole set of things we have to do. So transforming India is our goal and will remain for a long time. So therefore, the job of foreign policy will remain making that possible. And we are increasingly gaining the means to do so. But we're still not there yet. It's not like we can say, okay, we have all the means, in the next five years we're going to solve everything. No, in fact, if anything, over in the recent past, we've had to push it further away. But what about the situation in which we are? You know, we've gone through three sort of phases since independence. 
We were born into a Cold War world, bipolar between the Soviet Union and the US, and we chose non-alignment. We chose to work with both sides, but we chose not to get entangled in other people's fights, that we would choose where we'd get in. We'd suffered enough. Lin Lithgow had dragged us into the Second World War without consulting a single Indian leader when he was viceroy. And, uh, you know, I mean, look at the number of Indians who died as a result of that decision. And we were not even involved. So there was, there was no way we fight for independence and gain independence and then suddenly sign an alliance which commits us to fighting when somebody else decides it. There was no way we would join a bloc. Uh, but with the end of the Cold War, you ended up in a unipolar world, dominated by the US. Soviet Union collapsed. There was no East Bloc anymore. And you ended up in two decades of tremendous globalization, actually. If you look at the late 80s onwards until 2008, where there was a free flow of capital, trade was opened up, WTO was formed. And you actually did brilliantly in those years. You had an average rate of growth of around 8% if you take the whole Whole, just the globalization years, uh, and, and you adjusted tactically to the situation that you had then. But since 2008, the world economy has slowed down tremendously, made life much harder for you when you want to transform India and you depend on the world for things. And you now have a thoroughly confused situation. Today, the world is multipolar economically. China is really almost close to being as powerful economically as the US, actually is a bigger manufacturer than the US, uh, may not be as big a market, but in ma most commodities and things like steel, cement and so on, more than half the world's production is consumed by China, which means she's important at both, both ends of the... And if you look at the shares of global GDP, how they've shifted, in 1980, the advanced countries accounted, the OECD countries, accounted for 64% of global GDP. This is in PPP terms. Uh, by, and China was 2.3%, India was 3%, in fact, actually 2.9 or so. By 2016, the advanced countries are down to 42%. Uh, Europe's share has gone down from 30% all the way down to 16.7%. India is up to about 7.24%, and China is up to 17%. So just India and China together are close to 25%. The US has kept her share, roughly 25% still. From the late 70s, actually, she's been around there. Europe has dropped precipitously. I mean, from 30 down to 16 is a big drop. And the main gainers are here in Asia, in the Asia Pacific, actually. Uh, so, so the balance of power has shifted. Economic power, certainly, it's multipolar now. I mean, there are a whole series of economies who determine what happens in the world economy. Militarily, it's a problem. Militarily, it's unipolar still. You know, the Royal Navy used to have a two-navy standard, meaning they wanted to be as big as the next two navies put together. And that way they thought they could maintain their dominance in the world. Today, the US Navy is equivalent to the next 16 navies put together. So there's a 16 navy standard. You look at US defense budget, it's equivalent to the next seven or eight countries put together, defense budgets put together. That's unipolarity in military terms. So you have multipolar polar economy, unipolar militarily. Nobody's going to take on the US, at least nobody's sensible, nobody in his right mind. Politically, we're all thoroughly confused. And you can see the mess around us. You can see what globalization has done is to change our domestic politics. Because the more we globalize, the more threatened we feel in our identities, the more we displace people. You look at this massive wave of urbanization, I mean, it's true of India, it's true of China, it's true throughout the developing world. Of the 43 megacities in the world, 40 of them are in the old third world, or now emerging economies. And people have been dragged out of their traditional occupations, out of their village, out of their clan, out of their support structures. You're now in urban situations. China is already more than 50% urban. We will be by 2025. And I think we actually undercount the number of people we have in cities. Uh, 
And therefore, you have now a completely different politics of emotion, of mob psychology, of people who are exposed thanks to technology, thanks to the whole ICT revolution, who we now, I mean, other people's ideas come into the palm of your hands all the time. So you're actually in a whole different political environment where government's abilities, thanks to globalization, to deliver has actually diminished, whether it's in China, whether it's in India. And you see this in every which way. We've thrown away the weapon of tariffs, thanks to WTO, we're all bound. You look at the effect of, of interest rates. I mean, since 2008, you've had negative interest rates. And what did it do? Did it stimulate Western economies? No. So what happened to economics? What happened to the theory that the more you lower interest rates, the more you stimulate the economy? Growth? No, it just isn't. So those instruments aren't working, and growth is reverting to mean it's slowed down. So governments turn for legitimacy increasingly to nationalism. And the best example of this is China. The communists came to power using nationalism and communism, that we'll equalize the society and so on. Cultural revolution put paid to communism as legitimacy because people got this is, you know, it was a terrible experience for most of them. So then Deng Xiaoping based his legitimacy on growth. I will deliver growth and wealth to you, which they've done actually. They've become a middle income society, $8,000 per capita. But then growth started slowing after 2008, despite huge stimulus, the biggest stimulus actually ever in history. And growth is slowing, so now where do you turn? So you suddenly have a regime which relies on much more internal control. China spends more on internal security than it does on national defense today, and has for the last four years. But also relies on nationalism for its legitimacy. And you see the same phenomenon of new authoritarians, whether it's Abe, whether it's Xi Jinping, whether it's Modi, whether it's Erdogan, whether it's Putin, all the way to, in fact, Trump is the last one. The US is actually imitating the rest of the world. Uh, but basically, we are in a much more dangerous world, where the Westphalian state, to our west, of course, has vanished or is collapsing in West Asia. And to our east, you have very strong straight structures based on ultranationalism. And therefore, you have problems like the South China Sea, East China Sea, and you see these rubbing up against each other. And as I said, as our interests grow, we also start rubbing up against China in the periphery, which, is, which we share. It's our periphery, but it's also their periphery, when I mention the South China Sea. Uh, and this is only a partial list of changes. If you add to this climate change, the effects of, of technology, the global shift in manufacturing, in the base, the pattern, once you get digital manufacturing, uh, you see the revolutions in energy technology and communications. I mean, you think the changes and the shifts in the balance of power between states and in their relative power is going to be tremendous. So, so we have a new global economic order that's in the process of being for, formed, but we're still in the old one. So we're, we're sort of betwixt and between orders. We're not, we are in a stage of transformation where nobody can actually tell you where we are going. It's much harder for anybody to tell you, okay, this is where we'll be five years from now, 10 years from now. Uh, but this is a very destabilizing situation for everyone. So it's a dangerous world, it's a fragmenting world. You've seen economically the RCP, so you get economic blocks, you get North America separate, the US pulls out of TPP. Uh, and you have ultranationalism. And as I said, you have this problem of internal societies in churn changing very fast. Just to give you an example, in India, for instance, all the indices of violence, whether it was terrorist infiltration, deaths of security forces, et cetera, et cetera, were all declining steadily from 2000 to 2012. After 2012, two things have been growing. One is communal violence, and these are all on the MHA website. The other is social violence, crimes against a person, rape, those sort of things. And that is a reflection, actually, of the social churn that we're in. As we urbanize, as we, uh, by 2025, 75% of the global population will be urban, and about 70% of them will be living within 200 miles of the sea. 
And that's really quite a concentration if you think of it. And in terms of climate change, frankly, it's a disaster waiting to happen. For China, by, the, by 2025, 70% of all Chinese will be in cities. And for us, we'll be around 50% by then. Uh, and that's a huge change. So what should we do in this situation where there's uncertainty in the global system, where we're undergoing, we are also undergoing tremendous internal churn and change, and where it's hard to predict where exactly this, the, the globe is going. But our goal remains. Our goal doesn't change. And our means to achieve it have also increased compared to the past. There are some people who are so frightened by what they see. When they see this rise of China, they see the chaos, who say, oh, we should ally with the US. I mean, there's no other great power, superpower left. So they say we should do an alliance. For me, that's exactly the wrong answer. That's not the way to go. We've survived with strategic autonomy by one name or another, call it non-alignment, genuine non-alignment, whatever. We've used different words. Basically, we followed strategic autonomy since the beginning, and it's worked for us. As I said, it did provide sufficient security for us to be able to go through the best years in our history in terms of growth, in terms of changing our people's lives. Uh, I don't see how alliance today is going to solve our problems. No other country shares your interests your particular history, your resource endowment, this combination of having influence and power, but also having so many poor people and so many domestic preoccupations that we need to take care of. Uh, so it seems to me that actually, this is the time to actually double down on strategic autonomy. But to pick issues and to do issue-based coalitions with all those that you can work with. You do external balancing, in other words, as the IR vocab jargon would call it. You, if it's maritime security, you have an interest in the free flow of goods, your energy, oil, all that flows through the Indian Ocean, your goods flow further east. Now they use the word Indo-Pacific. Uh, but so do the Chinese. Their exports, their energy, so do the Japanese. Work with all three. But on other issues, you'll find different coalitions. Counterterrorism, frankly, there are very few people who actually share your interests. There are some, but not in your immediate neighborhood, and they're very hard to find, because nobody actually does. You might share information, but very few people are actually prepared to work together. But depending on the issue, cybersecurity, you need to build, therefore, different co issue-based coalitions and work in a world like this. We need to concentrate on our own periphery, because if we get entangled in our periphery, if we don't have a peaceful periphery, Frankly, it becomes much harder to transform India. And we need to do much more in our own neighborhood. Some people get very worried, oh, the US is withdrawing from Afghanistan. You know, I'm, I don't think that's the end of the world. Be grateful to the US, say thank you to them. They, they fought your war for you for free for so many years, 17 years. I think that's it's good of them. But frankly, if you were American, why would you stay in Afghanistan? I mean, it's not a direct threat to the US anymore. There's no Al-Qaeda left there, there's no, and so they'll do a deal and go. You have to take care of, and Afghanistan, if there is extremism, terrorism coming out of Afghanistan, not just a threat to you, it's a threat to China, it's a threat to Iran, it's a threat to Russia, whose soft underbelly has co-religionists with Afghanistan right across. So work with them, work with other people who, and that's what I mean when I say in this kind of fluid situation where everything is open, you also have to be open to working with different groups, different combinations. You need to be nimble to do that. Uh, of course, the biggest issue, strategic challenge long term for us is the rise of China. Because as I said, you have a very complicated relationship with China. You have the world's biggest boundary dispute. You rub up against each other in the periphery. Uh, but. At the same time, China is your biggest trading partner in goods. 18,000 Indians study in China today. That's a huge number. And you do things with China where you have a common interest on the international stage as well. You've worked together in WTO. You've worked together in, on climate change as well, in the basic. Uh, and so long as China-US contention increases, as seems to be the case, there will be space for powers like India, Japan, others, to actually work between them. But the, our problem, though, is that 
you can't run an activist, political, military, diplomatic outreach and be engaged with the world if you are shutting down your economy, if for the last three years we've been raising customs duties, we've been the most reluctant participant in our CP, and we seem to feel that free trade agreements are a threat to us. Uh, you can't do this. You either, if you're going to engage, you have to run all your policies in sync. You cannot separate, run a more protectionist economic policy when you're actually going out and making political and other demands on the rest of the world. So I think there is some work that we need to do here. Now, of course, I'm an optimist. I, I don't think that this is an impossible situation. I think there's actually sufficient play, but maybe we can talk about it when we go through the question and answer. And in any case, history is not a linear extrapolation from the past. Uh, but given the, you know, the, the present situation, if the UN estimates, for instance, that despite the grim, dim prospects for the world economy, if China grows at 3%, India at 4%, and the US at 1.5%, by 2040, by 2050, China's per capita income would be about 40% of US levels today. India's would be about 26% of US per capita income, which is where China is today. Uh, China would be the world's largest economy, uh, and India would be the second largest economy, and the US the third, and, and by that time we'd be overwhelmingly urban societies. So, so even if things slow down, as long as we can maintain this trajectory and stay engaged, rather than trying to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world, uh, I think we can, we can do, we can actually make, continue to make progress towards our basic goal of transforming India. I'll stop here, uh, but I'd like to make one last point. You know, we manage very often to confuse ourselves. Uh, somebody was saying, oh, you know, China's all over Africa, shouldn't we be there? Why? You should be there if it's in your interest. If it helps you to transform India, yes, certainly. You need copper, go and be friends with Zambia. That's in your interest. Don't go there because China is there. That's a waste of your time and everybody else's effort. And don't chase goals which actually are separate from the transformation of India. I personally think it's crazy to chase a seat in the UN Security Council. Why? How does it contribute to anything? Your job is to do what Gandhiji said. Wipe the tear from the eye of every Indian. If you can do that, then you've achieved something. Thank you. Uh, shall we do it from here, the question and answer? Yeah? OK, let me just get a piece of paper. So now tell me what you think. Don't tell me I silenced you. Um, thank you, sir, for an interesting talk. Uh, um, so my question is, I mean, I think overall in this talk, you talked about the insider perspective about uh, foreign policy. But from an outsider, uh, how does India is looked upon uh, from a foreign policy point of view? For example, like you said in many of your interviews and books, uh, if it comes to China, uh, China speak uh, in clear terms what their conditions are. So it's very clear to negotiate with them. But uh, for India, how does other nations perceive uh, regarding uh, foreign policy, that would be... You have to ask them. I mean, we are, it's very hard to be objective about yourself. I can tell you what they say because somebody put together what, how India is reflected in other countries' diplomatic archives, you know, in the cables and the reporting from their embassies in India through the 50... Because the 30-year rule applies. So we have a good idea of what at least Western embassies reported about us, what the Soviets reported, because all their archives are available, uh, until about 30 years ago, and which is, you know, the late mid-90s. So, and most of them say Indians love to negotiate. They don't know when to stop negotiating. So they don't make the transition from the middle phrase of negotiating to, okay, this is the end game, let's settle this once and for all. Uh, thirdly, we're very didactic. We tend to give long lectures and uh, 
we used to be called preachy, but that I think less, and certainly not in the diplomatic cables. That's the way we, they see our diplomatic style, our negotiating style. But I think everybody, when you look at and when you read those cables, you get a sense that they, that they take India more and more seriously over time. But that's a straightforward function of how much power you have and how you're willing to exercise it. You know, there's nothing like 30 years of 6% growth do wonders, and the willingness to actually go out and explode an atom bomb and say, you know, I have a will to power. I think those are things that make a huge difference, at least I found in my career. That when I joined in 72, went out for the first time in 74, the rest of the world treated you quite differently and by the time I left the Foreign Service in 2009. So it, it makes a big difference. Ultimately, that's what the world respects. It respects power. It's Thank a sad you. thing to say, but it's true. My question is, to what extent the idea of the ruling party or the incumbent government affect the foreign policy of the government? For example, in the present day government, Hindutva has a lot of parallels with Jainism in Israel. And I think that actually played a role in friendly relations with Israel. In that way, in that sense, analogically, how the ideology of the ruling government can? Well, you know, you can never separate ideology from what you, from foreign policy. But the fact is, when you have very few means, your choices are very limited. So the operation of ideology also is much more limited. When you're struggling to survive, when you're trying to do the basics, just to, you know, you're fighting wars, you fight, fought four wars in the first 23 years of the Republic. You know, that's not a time where you can pursue your ideological inclinations. You can't go around exporting yoga and so on when you're busy, you know, going to the Security Council to make sure that Kashmir stays, at least part, large part of Kashmir stays with you. There's, so ideology as a function, and as long as the goal was so clear, you know, transforming India, so the scope for ideology was much less in the early years of the Republic. Now, Today, you're in a situation where the world is much more ideological. I mean, as I said, you have these new authoritarians in power across the world. It's not only in India, it's in other places also. But if you look at the actual practice of foreign policy, it's very hard to find places where the practice has changed very much. And the Chinese have a good saying. They say, listen to somebody's words, but watch his actions. And if you watch the actions of what we've done, most governments have done much the same thing. Because, as I said, we are lucky. We have a clear goal. We know what we're supposed to do, what our goal is. Rather than, we might say various things. And every government in a democracy will claim we are the first ones to do this. We're the only ones. Everybody before us was lousy. And if you vote anybody else in, they'll be lousy too. Well, that is standard democracy. It happens in the US, happens everywhere. But that's irrelevant. Look at what we actually do and whether it's transforming the relationship with the US. From the 90s onwards, every, and we've had governments of every hue. I mean, from VP Singh's government onwards, it started in Rajiv Gandhi's time, so in the 80s. But every government, including communists without communists, NDA, UPA, whichever you call it, you know, they've all done the same things. Whether it was the nuclear weapons program, keeping our option open while they could, while they had to, keep their head down. Once you had the power, you actually went out and, and did it. As, Narsim, as Vajpayee said immediately after the 98 test, he said, I could never have done this if Narasimha Rao hadn't done the preparations and hadn't told me when he handed over to me, he told me, why don't you do it now? Now is the best time. So there are things where the, when you look at the big lines of policy, China policy, for instance, I mean, since We've had a reasonably successful China policy for the last 30, 35 years. We had disasters in the late 50s, early 60s. But after that, we haven't done badly in managing that relationship and at least keeping it off, you know, off. It doesn't stop us from doing what we need to do, more important things. We have bigger fish to fry. Those things, all these governments have done, despite all their ideological, and it hasn't changed that much fundamentally. There is a tendency now that you have power, you have agency, 
there is an increasing temptation to use foreign policy for domestic political gain. But my own sense, frankly, is that people in India don't vote on foreign policy. It's never, ever, I mean, the, I don't think anybody cares about this. And everybody assumes, you know, this is, you know, this is a profession. We have more immediate concerns. How's the economy doing? Do I have jobs? Do I have money, money in my pocket? Am I doing better today than I was yesterday? Do I think I'll be better off tomorrow than I am today? I mean, if you get yes to both questions, you'll get elected. If you say no to one, then you're not sure. No to both, finished. You'll lose the election. And, and I think that's it. I, I don't think foreign policy actually is a winning. It's quite remarkable. Mumbai happened within six months, 26-11, within six months of a general election. And if you look at it, it never figured in the campaign. Think of it. I mean, that's really quite a strange phenomenon. Advani tried once, twice, I think, around January 20th, 21st in Agra, then Meerut, to say, look at this, you know, terrible thing, the government failed, this, that. The pushback they got from the people was, how dare you play politics with a national tragedy? And they dropped it. They never mentioned it again. For the opposition not to raise it. It says something for the wisdom of the people, or at least their sense of what people would take and how they, they were reacting to it. So, but today I think we might be in a different situation. Maybe. I still don't think people vote on foreign policy issues. But maybe, you know, politicians think they do, in which case they'll behave differently. That's a different problem. Uh, hello, sir. I have a question. I have two questions, basically. So as you said, the China is being growing and the GDP is going fast. But the case is also that China's growth and GDP is also sponsored by so many chronic policies they have, the structure of the government they have. They have so many ghost towns being created and all these things added up to the GDP. So is it a bubble which is going uh, like in China? Like in 2008, there was a bubble in US which housing bubble there was. So is it China also on the same path, investing so much money? And second, why is the policy with Pakistan has still failed and still failing. Like, what has gone wrong? As an insider, what do you see? Well, China, you know, is China a bubble? I don't think so, not anymore. You could have argued in the beginning, oh, they lie, their figures are all. But the fact is, it is a huge economy now, and it is a working economy. But depending on their inclination, you, if you look at a shelf, of, it starts with, you know, uh, where, that when China rules the world, you get at one extreme. The other is the coming crash of China. And old Gordon Chang, who wrote that book, has been writing every year why it didn't happen this year, but will happen next year. Uh, so for me, neither of these is, is actually, these are the extreme positions. Martin Jacques also. China is a very different power and is not the US. She's in a crowded neighborhood. Her growth has probably peaked. She has a demographic crisis coming. By 2040, she'll have the age structure that Japan has today the grayest of the most of the advanced economies. So, you know, there are limits on China's growth. So it's not so much bubble bursting as there is a natural, and if you look at Japan, you look at South Korea, look at Taiwan, they all went through 30 years of fantastic growth, and then it leveled off. Some ended up in stagflation, I and mean, the Japanese will blame the plaza accords and so on. Others managed to make that transition better, to, but to a much lower growth trajectory. So, and that is what seems likely with China today, despite all these frightening debt figures and property prices, blah, blah, but they are deflating that, and they have levers of control which other economies don't have because of the role of the state and so on. So, I mean, that's, but that's my personal view. It, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily true. Uh, each one will give you a different version of what's like. Why is Pakistan policy a failure? Because of Pakistan because of the nature of Pakistan, you know. Uh, well, how do I? Ziaul Haq was asked, why are you doing nizam e mustafa when he started Islamization of Pakistan in, in the late 70s? And his answer was simple. He said, when an Egyptian stops being a Muslim, he's still an Egyptian. But a Pakistani stops being a Muslim, he's an Indian. So he has a fundamental problem there of how does he build an identity which is separate from you? There is a built-in, he got his independence from you. You got your independence from the British. The other problem is that it's a dysfunctional 
state society, there are, we are dealing with many Pakistans, at least five. There's the ordinary Pakistani civil society or whatever. We have no problem with them. There's no threat to India, there's nothing. There's Pakistani business who see competition, competition but you know, frankly, they, again, Pakistani civilian politician, no problem. Pakistan army, problem. They have an institutional interest in a managed level of hostility with you. Because that is what enables them to control politics, the government, budgets, etc. in Pakistan. And then all these jihadi tanzims, the religious right, who again, I, they have an ideological problem with you, but also they have an interest, it's a business for them. I mean, terrorism in Pakistan is a flourishing business and has been since the Afghan war days and vis-a-vis -vis India since 1948 when they sent tribal raiders into, into India. So your problem is that it's, it's built into, until you get, Pakistan is at peace with itself, it's most unlikely to be at peace with you. Now the Israelis have a phrase for, what, for this cross-border terrorism, this kind of, they say it's mowing the grass. You can't solve it militarily. There's no solution. But you have to keep going back in and mowing the grass. Because what happens if you don't mow the grass and cut it is much worse, the alternatives. So you will have to deal with this. The world's greatest power, the US, has tried to fix Pakistan, change, and so on. They failed. You don't have the power or the ability today to do that. In fact, when you do that, you actually feed the mo your enemies in these many Pakistans and you actually unite the rest of the country behind them, vis-a-vis -vis you. So, I mean, you'll have to live with this problem for a long time. So I don't think if you moderate your goals vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, you can call it a failure. Yes, we failed to achieve a decent relationship. We failed to, you know, and Pakistan is very reluctant, for instance, to even do the economic links, the MFN, all that. In the past, they used to say no. Now we've also withdrawn it. Now we've, we have effectively done kuti with them. We don't speak to them. So we don't go to SARC. But that's not a policy. And it doesn't really address. So because you are stuck in this cycle of, with this negative, you know, this unproductive cycle of a relationship with Pakistan, so therefore Pakistan is, can be used for domestic, or India can be used for domestic politics in Pakistan, and, in, in, and vice versa. You can use Pakistan's free. There's no cost, there's nothing to it. So you see it every day in the media, you see it all over the place, you see it in election speeches. And so, but that frankly is not what we should be watching. We should be actually watching the, the real outcomes on the ground. And that is a much more complicated problem to solve. You can't fix Pakistan. Sir, uh, how do we tackle the new hostilities in the Nepal, Sri Lanka? the new uh, neighborhood, new uh, kind of hostilities in Nepal, Sri Lanka, and other countries? Uh, look, if you were a smaller neighbor of India, with this huge neighbor, India, looming, big part of your economy, same ethnicities across the border, what would you do? Well, you're a new state. These are all brand new states. What would you do if you were a proud Sri Lankan, a proud Nepalese, you would look for some external balancer. You would do to India by then getting China involved. What India did to the US and the USSR in the 50s. And you would use China to get what you can out of India and use India to get what you can out of China. And if India and China are stupid enough not to talk to each other and to figure this out, that they're being had, then good luck to you as a Nepalese, as a Sri Lankan. So this is exactly what they do. It's built into the situation. You are the overwhelming, overweening power in the subcontinent. It, by every standard, they don't even have borders with each other, the rest of SARC. They deal with each other through you. You have cross-border ethnicities across every border. Every border is porous, including our border with Pakistan, despite all the fencing, your informal trade with Pakistan is three times your formal trade. And other borders, you know how porous they are. You've seen migration out of Bangladesh. You've seen Nepal, it's an open border anyway. But Sri Lanka also, I mean, you now have something like 108 flights in and out of Sri Lanka to India every week. 
and they are full. You can't get a seat on them. So, you know, from there, you have to look at it from their point of view. We have been yelling, I remember, I'm an old man now. We've been yelling, oh, the Chinese signed a rice rubber pact with Sri Lanka. The Chinese are coming, Chinese are coming. Chinese have been coming since the 50s. Now, when they were fighting a war, Sri Lanka against the LTT, you weren't willing to sell them weapons, so they bought weapons from the Chinese. And everybody in India said, what a terrible thing. But would you rather have those weapons in Chinese hands or in Sri Lankan hands? You know, at some stage, you have to understand their situation as well and deal with it. I don't think we have an impossible situation in our neighborhood. But if you expect them to love you, then you follow one set of policies. If you are interested in a peaceful periphery and in outcomes, then you follow a different set. Then you integrate them economically. You open your markets to them, as you have done to everybody except Pakistan. And you try and see that you build on the affinities, whether it's language, religion, culture, you name it. You have an interest in Bangladesh, for instance, in Bengali identity being strengthened in Bangladesh. And you're the only ones who can do that. Nobody else can do it. You don't want Bangladesh to go the way of Pakistan. That's the last thing you want. So work with them and strengthen their Bengali identity, strengthen their mass politics. They have things which Pakistan doesn't have. They have a separate identity of their own. They have mass-based political parties. Strengthen all that. Work with them. But then you're looking at outcomes. You're looking at a peaceful periphery, which you work well with. Do the economic integration. Open the markets to them. Do, and they've worked for the last 10 years with Bangladesh. You look at what you've achieved. They've cracked down on all those Indian insurgent groups. They've cleared it. They helped you with your security. And you've managed through power. You're providing power. They have no blackouts anymore, thanks to you. And you've changed the nature of that relationship in 10 years. And you can do that with each of the neighbors. It's not impossible. If you go in with this attitude that so-and-so is my friend, his opponent is my enemy, if you get stuck in their domestic politics, then you're finished. And it's a very easy attitude. You read the media, they'll always tell you, ah, Ranil is India's friend, and so-and-so, Rajapaksa is your enemy, and this. This is not politics. This is not India's interest. India's interest is a peaceful periphery integrated with India, which has stakes in the relationship with India and therefore works with you and aligns itself with you on the international stage. That's what you want to achieve. And it can be done. It's not impossible. We've done it successfully in the past, and I think we can do it in the future also. The moment you make it ego, you make it you know, individual leaders, you, and you treat it as a T20 match. Everything is either a six or a wicket and finished. You, you know, then you can't have a decent relationship with your neighbors. But it will be fraught, because for them, you are the overwhelming presence that they need to manage. I mean, you know, I, my Nepalese friends, for instance, Indians say instinctively to Nepalese, oh, you're just like us. We mean it friendly. To him, it's a threat. You're about to swallow him. And my Nepalese friends tell me, why do Indians say this to us? Because they really, it, it's, it's frightening, the thought that you can swallow them without even thinking. And you're doing this out of the best will in the world. So a little sensitivity, I think, we need. Thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. I'm sure that the ideas you've shared and the knowledge you have imparted have left a lasting impact on us. As a mark of our gratitude, may I request Professor Joe Thomas to felicitate the speaker with a memento. May I now request you, sir, to kindly leave us a message in the EML yearbook. We wish to express our heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon for his presence here with us today. I take this opportunity to thank all those who have rendered their unfailing support to us in organizing this lecture. I also thank the audience, without whose presence this lecture would not have been meaningful. Thank you.